Bonjour. Awesome. So I'm Kelly, this is Ty, and we'll be giving the module on the politics of SAD today. Um, we'll be going over kind of different types of politics of SADs, and then at the end, we'll talk about how to research for them and then what common responses to politics of SADs are. And if at any point you have questions, please feel free to ask us. Okay. So I wanted to start off by asking um, you guys, what you think the politics dissat is. Does anyone have any idea? Yes. Something about political capital. <laughs> yeah, so political capital is involved in some of these dissats, not all of them. Um, but essentially, a politics dissat is a dissat about the political process through which the plan must pass and the implications of the plan passing through said political process. Um, so the next question then is, how well do you guys understand the concept of fiat? What is fiat? Yes. I mean, it's. I think it's Latin for "let it be done." Okay. So what does it mean in a debate context? Like, oh. Yeah. It's the assumption that the plan like passes. Yeah. And when does the plan pass? Like, when the new term. Yep. So the plan passes immediately. And that is an assumption um, in fiating the plan. Um, when we fiat that the plan happens, does it go through certain political processes, or does it just magically happen? Raise your hand if you think it goes through certain political processes. OK? Raise your hand if you think it just happens. OK? A lot of you didn't raise your hand. Um, so essentially, when we say that we're fiating something and we're reading the politics to that, it means that the plan is going to happen immediately, but we're also under the assumption that in the passage of the plan, the plan has undergone all of these political processes, i.e. it has gone through the House, the Senate, the President, if need be, um, and that it has passed through all of these parts of the government um, as a piece of legislation, and that it has passed immediately. Does anyone know what this is called? Like the passage of the plan through Congress? No. OK, so this is called normal means. So we defend that the plan passes through normal means, i.e. passes as a piece of legislation through Congress, and that this happens immediately. And this enables us to kind of talk about uh, the consequences and the implications to the plan going through Congress. Does, our, does anyone have any questions about our definition of normal means and fiat and how that applies to debates on the politics this ad? Okay, can someone tell me what it means to fiat the plan happens when we're talking about a politics this ad? So like the plan will happen immediately, but it's like it already passed through, as you said, normal means. Mm -hmm. Meaning like it still goes to the Congress and all that, but it passes immediately and we don't have to defend implementation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so then the next thing that we'll start talking about is the different types of politics this adds. And we'll go through six types of politics this adds. So just keep track of each individual one of them um, and what we say about them. So the first one is the political capital disad. Does anyone know what political capital is? Anyone have any guesses? Yes. yes. Does it relate to like influence, etc.? Yeah. The political landscape. It does. Uh, anyone want to expand on that a bit? Yep. Like maybe it's like a resource that you can use in politics. Like you can use political capital to like pass a certain bill or something like that. Yeah, yep. for sure. So you can think of political power as the bargaining power, political capital, the bargaining power slash influence a leader, usually the president, has to implement policies that they support. How do you think the president acquires this political capital? 
guesses. Yes. Uh, like democratically, like elections, etc. So by being elected. Yeah. Kind of. It's I like. A I like. More... Yeah. That's one way. Uh, anyone else have examples? Yes. In personally authoritarian countries, they might just force people. <laughs> yes. Uh, although that's not necessarily political capital, and uh, more so, it's just uh, forcing things like to authoritarian be forcing power. power to be implemented. Yeah, because political capital applies to the policy making process, as in what the president is able to influence members members of the Congress do, like what he is able to kind of force them to do through his political power. Um, yeah. And some shows of political capital are like if we're bargaining with a member of Congress, if we're engaging in negotiations. Yeah, so you can think of like um, like a president walks onto the White House lawn and takes a picture with like uh, a congressperson that gets broadcast to the media or meeting with someone at dinner to discuss uh, different proposals and how they can get legislation done. Um, saying, I will support this thing that you want if, if you will you support, support my bill. Thing. Things of that nature. These are all ways in which leaders, usually presidents, bargain and use their influence to get things done, right? Because if the president is popular or seen as legitimate, then obviously people want to be working with the president, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that this is an infinite thing. Like, if some people aren't going to just support a bunch of policies that they oppose, which means there has to be some kind of political benefit for them to support support policies that they may not necessarily be in favor of, and presidents use political capital to get these to get it done. Right. So there's two theories of political capital. The first one is a finite theory of political capital, which means that once the president has used up his political capital, he doesn't have any more, and he has to regain it through some means, whether that's bargaining or engaging in. Um, some sort of negotiation with a like policymaker um, and like trading votes for things, adding on sections onto bills, etc. The second theory then is the infinite theory of political capital, which says that political capital can always regrow. Um, and this means that if you spend political capital on the right sorts of policies, then there's a return on that investment and you will always get political capital back that you can never fully deplete your political capital, and that there are always mechanisms for you to have more political capital, um, in the sense that you can continue to expend your political capital and that you will always have more. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that being said, let's take a look at an example of what a political capital disadvantage could look like. So for uniqueness, uh, you would simply discuss any kind of bill that was in Congress now, or that, yeah, any kind of bill that the president is supporting. Does anyone have an example of something? Like a major agenda item that you know of? Yeah. The wall? Yeah, sure. Uh, this will uh, get a bit more difficult when we get to the internal link impact here for certain reasons, but sure. So say Trump is spending political capital or pull cap or PC, it's also known as, mm -hmm. on wall. So yeah. obviously, the wall is a very contentious item. A lot of people don't really want to vote for it because they think it's silly, uh, they think it's exclusionary, things of that nature. But Trump wants to get it done, which means he's pushing um, people in Congress to vote for this. So right? the uniqueness is that right now he has a lot of political Yeah, so he's using his influence uh, that he has and choosing to invest in particular things, such as getting the wall built, right? Meeting with different people in Congress, making phone calls, going to dinners, taking pictures, mm -hmm. all the kind of bargaining tools that presidents have at their availability in order to get some kind of agenda item done. Which means, you, we would want to argue that it will be built now. Right? So that's the uniqueness level of it. Just what's going on in Congress, what's the president up to? Mm -hmm. um, the link level is how the plan trades off with that. Does anyone have any ideas as to how that might be possible? So given that the uniqueness is that right now he has a lot of political capital, what might the link be? Yes. yes. Implementing the wall would make him lose political capital? Um, Close? It would, but, he, but right now he's, he <laughs> wants to use it on the wall. 
he, he's using it on the wall instead of other things. So consider that the link has to be tied to the plan. Yeah. How could the plan impact yes. it? Yes. The plan causes him to lose local count. Yes. Right. So the link is that the plan leads to a loss in political capital. So uh, say the topic was uh, uh, someone named something that you're interested in, like a political issue. No one here is interested in any political issues? Or one that you're not interested in? It can literally be. Any, any. political issue. Oh I'm sure you all know at least one thing. There yeah. was something on the military aid topic about like Trump like sure. supporting military yeah, aid. Yeah, military okay. aid. Say we're talking about the military aid topic, the JANFEB topic. A lot of you probably debated this. Um, so we would want to argue that military aid is controversial. Or rather pulling it out is. So like that uh, would be the plan yes, action. Yeah. Withdrawing. So, if we propose cutting military aid, honestly, a lot of people in Congress, especially Republicans, who are mostly in favor of the, we're, we're much more likely to be in favor of the wall. Like, no, we want this military aid. We think it's good for security. We think it's important to our alliances, et cetera, et cetera. They are not gonna just vote for this bill without any kind of prodding. So then Trump has to redirect his focus from the wall to military aid, i.e., he's still, taking pictures, going to dinners, making phone calls, things of that nature. But in all of those interactions, he's not talking about the wall with people, he's talking about military aid and how he wants to cut it. Which then means that it diverts his political capital from things such as the wall towards withdrawing military aid. Which means that he can no longer effectively get policies such as the wall done, mm -hmm. because he's all, already spent all of his political capital trying to push through policies such as military aid. So the internal link for this scenario would be that in passing the plan, the president loses political capital and is no longer able to pass X other policy. The impact, which doesn't super make sense for this scenario, is that X policy is a good thing, which means that not having enough political capital to pass it results in something detrimental. Yeah. So um, the way you can think of the internal link is that people in Congress have uh, a certain tolerance level for which policies they can tolerate, i.e. they may be willing to vote, work with Trump on one thing, maybe two things that they are actually in favor of because of the political benefits it gains them, say Trump promises to support something that they're in favor of, they get good publicity from working with the president, things of that nature. But if he keeps telling them again and again, I need you to vote for this thing, that all of your constituents are against, um, I know you're personally against this, most of the, uh, most of like, you, you know, the people you uh, get along with well politically in Congress are against, people are going to hit a certain limit level in which they say, no, I'm no longer willing to work with you, I've already worked with you enough. Um, stop trying to shove your policies um, at me because I'm simply not interested in it. Yep. Um, which is why um, this, the finite theory, is particularly important. Because if political capital is finite, that means if Trump spends it on ending military aid, he doesn't have as much political capital left to spend on something such as the wall, meaning that he's less likely to get policies such as the wall implemented. Okay. Then, yeah, one last thing real quick for the impact. You just have to say why the original policy was good. So here you would say the wall is good, which is why this policy is the best politics to decide to read, since that's probably fighting a losing battle. But this just provides an example of how you could read the disadvantage. So, yeah. yeah. How does one measure political capital? So it's not something you would quantify like, oh, Trump has 10 political capitals now, mm -hmm. but it's rather something that um, people in Congress perceive and if they feel that the president has sufficiently low political capital, then they won't be willing to work with the president anymore. And news articles talk about this. So like, if you're reading the news and it's talking about a certain policy, it might say that Trump has a lot of political backing on this policy, or like he is able to sway a lot of Congress members. Alternatively, it could be like, Trump is fighting a losing battle with this policy, which would mm -hmm. indicate that his political capital is lower. Yeah, like if a president keeps getting their policies implemented, that's a pretty reliable sign that they have a lot of political capital. Mm -hmm. But if they keep proposing policies that the Congress shuts down, that's a good sign that no one actually cares about them 
that much, and they don't have that much political capital. Like, did you have a quick follow up? What type of author is like talk about political like books that like so specifically mentioned? This is something that we'll get to later with researching the politics to that. Um, is that the politics to that is all about what is currently happening in politics, which means that instead of reading like peer reviewed articles and books, it'll mostly come from news sources. Yeah, the only main exception would be like some of the link slash internal link stuff. They're like political scientists that will write about the theory of political capital, and they'll go back and forth. Like, is it finite or infinite? And then there'll be like, you know, professors and whatnot, people who are highly qualified writing about these things. But for a lot of it, like the uniqueness level, uh, the impact level, even some of the link level, it's just like articles like CNN, NBC, etc. Um, so now that we've gone over the first type of politics to set, can we do a fist to five for how well we understand it? And close your eyes, too. So five means I think I could go be president and how use political capital. One means what is politics? I don't even know anything that's happening. So fists up so we can see it. And yeah, we need everyone, please. Okay, cool. You can put your hands down and, and open up. your eyes. Yeah. So the next politics to set we're going to go over is called the agenda politics to set. And this one is another fairly common slash popular politics to set that people read. Um, and it's pretty similar uh, like in story to the previous decide. It's just that it doesn't rely on political capital. Mm -hmm. So this one is, like Kelly said, uh, pretty similar to a political capitalist advantage, except, except the president will not be part of this. And instead focuses on what Congress is working on and if Congress is uh, sufficiently unified to get their goals accomplished. So the argument negatives would make is that Congress is working towards X thing now. The plan kind of interrupts Congress and leads to partisan fights where both parties disagree and means that they can no longer cooperate to get other important agenda items done. So uh, let's take a look at what that might look like. So uh, someone tell me a bill that's either passed Congress in the past or, uh, it's really could, or it could be popular now, just something that might come up in like they just recently like raised the federal minimum wage? Yeah, okay. sure. Um, so suppose, I don't know when that happened, if that was like a few weeks ago, suppose the federal minimum wage isn't w raised yet, um, but it's about to be. And that we're fairly confident that Congress is able to pass it because they um, are united on this issue. Yeah, so like all the big news sources are saying like they've got just enough votes in both chambers um, like these people are for it, these people have said they're against it. You know, they're generally in a good mood. Uh, both parties are working together because they think people need higher wages, things of that nature. Um, generally, all of the, you have articles saying it's going to get raised now. Um, this isn't something that the president is necessarily dealing with. Uh, the president will sign it into law, but it's not something that Trump or any other president is actively spending political capital on. They're just happy to see what happens in the Congress. The link would be plan is partisan and vex unity. Can someone tell me what it means to be partisan? Yes. Just not like one political party supports it, the other hates it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So bipartisanship is when both parties are working on an agenda item. So right now we'd say you'd want to say that the federal minimum wage is bipartisan, that there's some support from both parties. Uh, say the plan, we'll take the military aid example. Um, this is something that uh, a lot of Republicans support. Keeping military aid, all of Democrats oppose it. Uh, particularly Saudi Arabia was uh, any, a country whose military aid uh, came up heavily within Congress this year. So we would want to argue that if we end military aid to countries such as Saudi Arabia, all the Democrats are going to support it and all the Republicans are going to be against it, or at least something close to that. Which then means that they're no longer unified to accomplish other items such as the federal minimum wage, i.e. it creates this big divide and a bunch of animosity within Congress. Um, of course, after that, no one's really going to want to work with each other anymore, which means the bill fails, the original bill, right? Um, you can imagine a situation in which Congress is unified, and then they fight, and everyone is extremely angry at each other. 
after that, chances are they're not going to come right back and say, oh yeah, back to that original minimum wage bill we forgot about. They're simply not going to work, want to work together anymore because they won't trust each other. They'll feel like their ideological disagreements are so large that they can't possibly work to, to get anything done since the party's ide ideologies are simply too diverse. The impact then would then be uh, that raising the minimum wage is good. So there are multiple arguments you can make for this. Once again, we're just taking our original uniqueness argument and using that to support our impact by saying whatever policy Congress was going to pass that the AFD rails is ultimately a good policy for America or the world. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yes. Yeah. Could it be like a president's agenda also? So that would be political capital. Oh. So both of these are about the agenda. It's just that political capital is about the agenda of the president, whereas agenda politics is about the agenda of Congress. Can people do it the opposite way? Like it prevents passing like a bad bill? Yeah, so yeah, that's what we'll get That's actually right what next. we're about to get to. Uh, before we go there, any other questions? Okay, uh, close your eyes real quick. If there's anything so far that you do not feel confident in your understanding of and need us to continue to address, please raise your hand. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we'll go on to uh, that question right now. So the next thing that we'll go over is reverse politics disasters, um, which are a little more applicable and relevant under Trump. Um, because obviously the political situation is a little different, political capital isn't really that high, and neither is Congress very bipartisan. So first we'll do the reverse politics scenario for the political capital disaster. Um, and what this disaster scenario looks like is that right now Trump has very low political capital. And specifically, when you're looking for uniqueness for a reverse politics scenario for a political capital disaster, it'll be that Trump's political capital is low with some specific political faction or group. Like right now, he doesn't have the support of uh, like moderate Republicans, or like he doesn't have the support of really, really left-leaning liberals. Something to that effect. The link is that the plan is a win for Trump. That it is something that is. Uh, seen in a good light by said by like whatever political faction this is um, that previously was not supporting Trump and that it makes him more redeemable. The internal link then is that Trump gets enough political capital to pass some other policy, right? And that this political faction specifically and their support is key to helping Trump pass this policy. The impact then is that X policy that Trump passes is bad. Does everyone understand this scenario? It's like the political capital disaster, but flipped um, under Trump. Does the distinction make sense? Yeah? To put it in more material terms, you can also think of this with the same world example. So here you'd say Trump's political capital is low, so no one cares what he has to say about the wall. Um, but the plan uh, makes him see, be seen in a good light. So people are like, hey, Trump's got some good ideas. Maybe the wall isn't so bad after all. He uses that increased political capital to implement the wall and get it built. And then you say the wall is really bad for like, the environment or for the economy or for whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the same reverse politics scenario also applies to the agenda politics to SAD. So the reverse politics disad there is that right now Trump is seen in a bad light by everyone and also that Congress is really partisan, as are the bills passing through it. So it might be something like a marijuana bill or like an abortion bill or something that's super controversial is trying to be passed through Congress right now um, and Congress is really divided because of this bill. The link is that the affirmative is something that is bipartisan and widely supported by both parties, which means that the immediate passage of the affirmative helps Congress regain unity and cooperation. And that with this cooperation, they would be able to work together on whatever original agenda item it was. So for instance, um, a couple topics ago, there was a national service topic um, which was a really bipartisan move. 
because a lot of Democrats wanted to see an increase in AmeriCorps and Peace Corps, and a lot of Republicans wanted more conscription. So this would have been an affirmative that was bipartisan in nature and might have worked to reunite Congress. The internal link there is that this bipartisanship um, helps Congress uh, kind of get a boost on whatever original um, agenda item they were trying to pass. And that because they get this boost in unity um, and that they're able to work together to kind of get the last remaining votes to pass this agenda item, um, the impact is that this item will be passed and that this item is really, really, really bad. Does everyone understand the reverse politics scenario for agenda politics? Cool, let's do a fist to five on the four scenarios we've talked about so far. And close your eyes, please. Fists, please. Uh, everyone, please. Okay, cool. Um, you can put your hands down. Yeah. Um, so the next decide that we'll go over is the wag the dog decide. Does anyone have any idea of what wag the dog means? Or like any guesses. Okay, so the wag the dog decide uh, is also called the Bates decide, and it's called wag the dog because it means that the tail is wagging the dog as opposed to the dog wagging the tail. So what this means is that whoever should be in control, i.e., the president, is no longer in control, and instead is being wagged um, by the tail. So wag the dog. The base decide. Real quick, someone, anyone, let me know if you're not okay with me erasing this so I can put the new content on the board. Oh, wait, I'm erasing cool. this stuff then. Um, so, the whack the dog decide, whatever is supposed to be um, controlling is being controlled instead. So, under the Trump scenario, the whack the dog decide is really, really popular because Trump is super reliant on his base. And he fluctuates a lot um, on his opinions on policies based on what exactly his base wants or his base thinks. So the uniqueness for this scenario is that right now Trump's popularity is sustainable with his base. That he's been pretty consistent on issues, that the base seems sees Trump as like doing good for whatever policies that they want to get passed, um, and that generally he's in a pretty good place with his base. They're supporting him um, and like he's pretty popular uh, with these people who he calls his base. The link is that the affirmative is seen as a sort of flip-flop policy, which means that originally Trump might have said, oh, I hate this policy, and then passed it, or Trump have been, may have been in total favor of something, and then the plan got rid of it, right? So like, depending on whether the plan is uh, like a positive action or like taking something away. So this, Whatever policy that the app is would be in the opposite direction of Trump's campaign promises. So like maybe during the campaign, Trump was like, I will make sure that we continue to supply military aid to all the authoritarian countries in the world. And then the military aid uh, like plan, any plan, would have been like a huge flip-flop on this issue because it meant that Trump was withdrawing and pulling out military aid from whatever country which meant that this leads to kind of backlash from his base, and his base becomes dissatisfied with the way that Trump is handling said issue. The internal link here is that Trump's popularity, specifically with his base, goes down. And this is really bad because, as like the name of the dissad suggests, Trump is wagged, or like the base wags Trump, as opposed to Trump controlling the base. Um, so what this means is that Trump Losing the popularity of the base will lead him to do something really bad um, because he is a hothead and he wants to regain control of his base. And that takes us to the impact, which usually is something like diversionary conflict. It'll be like, in order to regain the trust of his base, Trump will initiate some sort of war somewhere else so that there will be what is called the rally around the flag effect. Does anyone know what that is? Yes. Uh, it's like, I guess it's like a strategy mainly used by authoritarian leaders where like when their popularity is low, like they start conflict or like a sense of like pride naturally. Yeah, that's 
That's exactly what it is. And it's true of the US as well, because um, if you look at like statistics, popularity of the president always goes up when we enter a war. And the war always is going to distract the populace from focusing on whatever bad policy was passed right before it and focus instead on like American nationalism and winning the war, um, which means that Trump is super likely to start things like a diversionary conflict or a war in order to distract his base um, from being angry at him and instead get behind him. Yeah, uh, so I'll give you an example. So after 9-11, the 9-11 attacks, uh, George Bush's popularity skyrocketed because he was able to unite the American people around like this common terrorist enemy by saying, oh, the problem isn't like Republicans or Democrats, it's you know these terrorists that we need to go invade militarily and get rid of. Which then meant that everyone is kind of united in defeating this common enemy. And his popularity skyrocketed. Uh, it helped him win re-election um, in large part due to these uh, due to these conflicts that the US was engaged in because everyone was supported in this common patriotism rather than focusing on internal divisions over whatever the affirmative may talk about or whatever else may have been going on at that time. Yeah, and this sort of base dissat uh, argument has been proven in the past because Trump changes his behavior a lot based on what his base thinks. So for instance, like Trump dropped the so-called mother of all bombs on Syria, right? Like that is a sort of move that he would do were his base uh, to get angry at him, which means that if the plan really does, um, or like really is a flip-flop policy that leads his base to be dissatisfied with the way that he is passing policies or the kind of policies that he is proposing and getting through Congress, he is going to do something like start a diversionary war or some other really, really bad impact. Yeah. So like, assuming like, you're doing this topic, for example, right? Mm -hmm. and, like, instead of like someone who's like as irrational as Trump, you have like someone like Abe. Like, how mm -hmm. would this apply? Because like, he wouldn't like view as something as stupid as like start a war. Against yeah, China. for sure. So the base dissent is definitely very contingent upon who your leader is, right? So it may be way less applicable on this topic, given that our political leader is Abe, since it'd be hard to prove that X impact would actually happen. Yeah. Uh, not only that, it would also be hard to prove that Abe has a base. especially be t uh, reliant on a particular base. Mm -hmm. So Trump uh, is unique in that he isn't very popular across the uh, across the political spectrum, but among his base, he's completely revered, which means that these supporters, these core supporters, are essential to all of his political operations. For Abe, that's not so true, since he's able to appeal more so to moderates and other people that are just more on the center right rather than a very specific base, which is what Trump relies on. So, this to five again on the base is at please. Okay, cool. You can open your eyes now. Um, so the last politics-ish scenario that we'll go over is midterm slash elections. Yes. So, as you'll probably know, um, there's an election coming up, um, or a number of elections coming up in the US, uh, 2020. So you will definitely start to see these arguments become more and more popular. Um, maybe not so much in the first semester of this season since the election is still a way off, but probably more so in the second semester of this season. And if you will be debating in the Next uh, fall of 2020, yep. this will be one of the biggest policy arguments around because It'll be all over the news. Were you raising your hand? Yeah, um, I had a question about the lack the dog this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you like apply that to like leaders, even if they're not specific to the act or the resolution? Like, could you say that like, I don't know, like the if Japan amended Article Nine, like the base of Trump would get angry about the U.S. Japan alliance? So right. So what happens is that you can, but not specifically for this topic, right? So like we would have to be talking about the leader of the country that is passing the policy, and the way that you would tie it back to the leader, say that it's a US policy, is that Trump always gets blamed for the policies, regardless of whatever like stance he took on it during its passage. Like The passage of the policy gets blamed on the president because people are looking towards the president, and so does the base. For this topic specifically, um, it probably would not work to say that 
whatever action that Japan is taking would then influence Trump's base and cause him to lash out or start a diversionary war. Um, but definitely, it doesn't always have to be the president who is the actor of the plan in order for the base to decide to apply. Okay. The one caveat would be, if you somehow had evidence that said Trump had promised his base Japan would not amend Article 9, yep. and that then somehow his base would blame Trump for Japan amending Article 9 and get yeah. angry, then you could read it. But chances are that piece of evidence doesn't exist because Trump's base probably doesn't care about Article 9. Yep. And he hasn't talked about Article 9 specifically very much. But if that evidence did exist, you could read this uh, disadvantage on the Japan topic. Okay, back to midterms and elections. Yes. So there is, uh, so in 2020, there will be a presidential election, as I'm sure you know, as well as midterm elections, which are elections or or not, or not necessarily midterm elections, I guess, but just congressional elections. Um, midterm elections are elections that happen two years in the two years before and after a presidential election. So, for example, in 2018, we had a midterm election. Mm -hmm. It's called midterm because it's in the middle of a president's uh, term. Uh, but there will be elections, a number of important elections coming up in 2020. So, for the unique this year, um, you want evidence not about a particular policy, but about a particular candidate. So say uh, I was a person who just didn't really like Trump, but I didn't care which Democrat won the election. I want uniqueness evidence that said Democrats win in 2020. And I might say, I don't care who wins, just as long as it's not Trump. But uh, I just think it's important that a Democrat will win and have good evidence that a Democrat will win. Um, this can be based on things such as like polls from the public, um, approval ratings, uh, which is the support a president has among the people, what percent of people approve their policies. Mm -hmm. um, other things such as like donations, generally if a president or if a candidate is receiving more donations, that correlates well. Um, things of that nature. Um, there are a number of indicators that people use, but there are good sources that will attempt to model the election and forecast what will happen. Um, the link then would say that the plan somehow, um, the plan becomes a major election issue. Um, Uh, so this could happen in two ways. Um, one, it could be tied to the Democrat. Or two, it could be tied to Trump. So if it's tied to the Democrat, uh, you would argue that the plan, so uniqueness is the same, Democrats will win. Say the plan gets tied to Democrats. So say it's... Um, you know, something that Democrats have supported for a long time, like uh, universal health care, okay? Or some Democrats have at least supported that. Um, you would then argue that is unpopular, and it would cause that Democrat to lose. So, say we're talking about universal health care, you would say, um, you, I, actually, um, you would most actually, since Trump's president, you would generally actually see the second one. Yeah. Um, sorry, scratch that. Uh, for the most part, it could sometimes be tied to a group Democrat, but more often than not, it'll be tied to Trump, since Trump's the one that's going to sign into the law, into the law, and at, at least in this particular case. It's different if you're in an election where there is no incumbent. Does anyone know what an incumbent is? Yeah. Someone who's already in office. Yeah. So because Trump's already in office, if the app, gets, if the app, app happens, it's probably Trump's doing, because Trump has to sign into law. Um, he obviously is ma ma majorly, massively influential on the Congress, um, especially Republican members of Congress and things of that nature. Um, in an election where there is no incumbent running, it could get tied to either candidate, but generally at least for the next election cycle, cycle which is the one we all care about, uh, it'll be tied to Trump. Um, the internal link then would be that this causes Trump to win.
So let's use this military aid example. So say I'm talking about military aid, ending it. The affirmative makes Trump end military aid. I would want good evidence that when Trump ends military aid, that's incredibly popular among the public and it makes them more likely to vote for Trump as opposed to the Democrat because they realize Trump represents their views because they say, I'm also against military aid, so I support Trump. And that means that I'm going to vote for Trump because I see him as representing me more than the Democrat and Trump wins. There are three main categories of people that we'd want to focus on here because it's important to remember that some voters aren't going to change their minds no matter what Trump does, so just like Trump's base. Um, a, so a lot of the time, Trump could probably pass a military aid policy or not pass it, and most of them would still vote for Trump no matter what. So those are the kinds of people we want to focus on. We want to focus on who would specifically uh, change their mind due to particular policies. Uh, does anyone have any examples of this? Does everyone understand the question? Yeah, my question is, what voters would be most likely to change their minds? Yes, yeah. moderates on both sides. Yeah, moderates. moderates. So here I have independents. Uh, we can also add in like moderate Democrats and Republicans. So these are people who may not have their mind made up and they're kind of unsure, they're going back and forth. But then if a bunch of moderates want to end military aid and that's what Trump does, at least some of them, enough to possibly swing an election, are going to say, okay, I'm voting for Trump now because of this new policy, Trump's aligned with my views, and therefore they vote for Trump. Are there um, any other groups that you all can think of? Okay, so another one is swing states. Who could tell me what a swing state is? Yep. Yeah. Like states like Florida that typically have like an almost equal number of Democrats and Republicans? Yeah, yeah. so Florida is a huge one. Uh, the 2000 election, uh, was decided because Florida was so close, the case had to be sent to the Supreme Court, uh, who ruled on how the votes in Florida should be counted, and Bush ended up winning. So obviously states like Florida are humongously influential upon the outcome of an election. But obviously different swing states care about different things, right? Um, so like voters in California, may, well, California's not a swing state, uh, I guess voters in Florida may care uh, about different issues than people in like Michigan or Pennsylvania, right? Like Pennsylvania has a lot of manufacturing. So manufacturing issues are going to be particularly important in a state such as Pennsylvania, whereas Florida has a lot of tourism, which means an alphabet tourism might be cons perceived um, considerably more by voters within the state of Florida. Um, so if we had evidence that voters in particular swing states were for or against ending military aid, then that might, then that would help us read the election's disadvantage. So say we had a piece of evidence that people in Florida were generally inclined to be against military aid for whatever reason. If a bunch of Floridians see Trump getting rid of military aid, then they're going to be more likely to vote for Trump. And because Florida is such an important state in any election, they're then more likely, then Trump is more likely to win because he wins an important state. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, quick question. So like, I feel like this elections one, it kind of comes down to like, like your impact. I feel like it's really heavily like predicated upon like probability, right? Because it's like it's probable. Uh huh. Probably. So like, how do, how would you like defend that against like people with like different statistics? Because I feel like it's like. like so politics. that's a question of the research you're doing. So some people write about the writing about the election are just going to be hacks who obviously favor one party. Mm -hmm. But there are groups such as like 538. Has anyone heard of 538? Okay, this is one you should definitely write down. They do election models for every election. Um, the man who runs it, Nate Silver, I believe correctly predicted all 50 states in the uh, 2012 election. I think in 2008, he got like 49 out of 50. And he also called like every Senate race correctly. Um, an incredible statistician who's very well respected by everyone across the political spectrum. Uh, he has a team of political scientists and statisticians who construct models based on accounting for almost every political factor. And they say, we think it's about this likely that uh, Trump will win or that the Democrat will win. And so you can then use good evidence like that saying, 
well, it's not certain that this person's going to win, but our evidence says this is most likely. The affirmative would uh, flip that because of the different factors we've talked about. Yeah, so it all comes down to evidence comparison um, and what sort of nuanced weighing you are doing between pieces of evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one that I'd like to highlight here is voter turnout. Who can tell me what that is? Like the people will actually like go to the ballot instead of just like yeah. go to the polls. Yeah. So in order for voters to turn out, they usually have to be pretty motivated. They have a reason to show up. Um, so uh, if say a bunch of Democrats are uh, against military aid as well, because we already established that a lot of Democrats are, um, say they're only voting actually because they want to elect a candidate who will end military aid. If Trump already does that, then a lot of these people might just not show up because they're like, well, I was voting because I wanted to end military aid, but then that already happened, so why am I even going? This is, the th this is what I care about. So that means that these people who um, are clearly democratic, they aren't going to vote for Trump, but they may not care as much about voting, so then some of them simply don't show up. Um, that means that there are more, a greater percentage of Republicans than Democrats that show up to the election, meaning that it's ultimately more likely that a Republican such as Trump would win. The last part of this is the impact. And here, uh, there are two routes you can say. Um, it's either Democrat is good or Trump bad. So you can say Trump's bad because if he stays in the presidency, um, we'll build the wall, or you know, propose a bad economic policy or something. You could say Democrats are good because they'll fix climate change, they'll raise the minimum wage, or something of that nature. You would just want evidence arguing for a particular candidate or for another one. Um, everyone close your eyes real quick. On a scale of one to five, one being um, what's an election, five being I think I'm an election expert. Please show uh, sh uh, show your hands. Hands. Yeah. Everyone, please. Okay, now we would like to know how well you understand the six politics to SAS that we just uh, went over. So do it again. Okay, cool. Um, everyone can open their eyes and put their hands down. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is politics dissads as an effective strategy. So the reason why politics dissads, I think, are really strategic are because they don't require any particular link, right? All you have to do is pin down that the affirmative uses the USFG, that they are fiating, that the plan happens immediately, and that in this fiat, they include normal means meaning that we can debate about the political processes and how the passage of the plan affects them. Which means that if it's like a really, really tiny plan act that you don't have any like other prep against, a politics to sad would be something that would be really helpful. It is a useful generic because it will link to any plan on the topic as long as the plan actually does something and like passes uh, whatever plan as a policy which means that it is a useful thing to have always. Um, and politics disads can obviously be read by themselves, just as disads to the affirmative, but a lot of times debaters will also read them with an agent counterplan, like the 50 states counterplan, or the Congress counterplan, or the president counterplan, um, depending specifically on which scenario of the politics disad they have read. So for instance, with the agenda politics to sad, they might read it with a 50 states counterplan, where they say that instead of Congress or the USFG implementing the policy, the 50 states do it again, which means that we get to avoid the politics to sad. So the politics to sad coupled with an agent counterplan um, is usually a good strategy that a lot of people will read. Um, and it is something to consider when you're cutting the politics to sad if you want to also find like a solvency advocate for some agent counterplan that would solve back for the dissad. Um, the next thing that we want to go over is researching for the politics to sad. And we've touched on this already, but research for the politics to sad is all about what is current in politics and what has been going on recently. So instead of looking at scholarly sources, right, or books, usually it'll just be a Google search 
which means that researching for the politics to sad is fairly simple if you know exactly what scenario you're looking for and what the pieces of evidence you need are. You'll just type it into like the Google bar, uh, find new sources that talk about this issue, and then cut those cards and tag them in a way that makes your politics to sad make sense. And what's really important when you're researching politics to sads is recency. You need to find evidence that is recent, which is why like the search function in Google where you can sort by date or like filter, you only want it from the past week or the past month, is really, really useful. Because you wanna be sure that your evidence on what is currently happening in politics and in government is recent. Because otherwise your disad would probably be non-unique. Yes. Wait, what's the filter for like getting it at a certain yeah. date? So if you search something in Google, um, and you conduct the search, you can go to tools, and then on the left-hand side, it'll say any time, and then you just pick what time you want. All right. And another thing to deploy when you're researching for the politics this ads um, is news alerts, which means that you set an alert in Google that is specifically about whatever policy that your politics this ad is about, so that you can get email notifications every time there is more uh, like news articles that are written on this topic, and also so that you can make sure your politics this hat is still unique. Yeah. What is a good rule of thumb when considering recency, like one week ago, one month ago? Um, one month is probably going to be too, too long. Yeah. A week is good if you have a really, really good card that has a lot of warrants. Mm -hmm. uh, but you generally want to have at least some cards, at least in your back pocket, that are a day or two old, or even from that day. Yep. Because otherwise, like, if you record an a piece of evidence from a week ago, and then they're like, actually, we've got a card from yesterday that says, yeah. it just says non-unique, because yep. something changed in Congress, then you're kind of in a tough spot, since they're just going to have more recent evidence saying, the political atmosphere has changed, and it's not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. So. The politics to sad and reading it requires a lot of research, but also consider that this research isn't super hard to do, right? It's easily accessible. You find it on Google. It's like news articles that you might be reading for fun if you're really into politics. Um, so yeah, just make sure that all your evidence is recent. Yeah, and if you have news alerts, a lot of times the politics to sad will literally come to you. Yeah. You might get an alert that says, Trump's proposing X bill in Congress from whatever news source you follow. You can then turn this into your own politics disadvantage by just going to the articles and actually turning them into card evidence. Um, the last thing that we'll talk about today is some of the jargon that is used in politics to sad, um, as well as some like common responses to politics to sad. Um, so does anyone know what a thumper is? A thumper? Cool. Um, so a thumper is something that should make that should have made the politics dissat happen already. So it is like some other policy or some other event that should have triggered the link scenario and led to the impact, but it didn't. Which means that the dissat it like disproves the thesis of the dissat because it'd be like this other policy should have led to a by or should have led to a partisan congress and like stopped whatever policy from passing but it didn't so a thumper um, is always something that you want to have if you're uh, like concerned about hitting politics to sad um, and it's probably something that your opponents will read on you if you're reading a politics to sad always thumpers and there's a bunch of thumpers for every single politics to sad based on what issues are like yeah so like, for example, suppose we were talking about the minimum wage agenda, the sad we were talking about earlier. If I had a thumper that's like, Congress is debating abortion now, obviously super controversial issue. You know, it's completely partisan. It's like, why, why hasn't the minimum wage bill already failed? If your dissent is actually true, they're already debating this other thing that's way more controversial. That should have disrupted the minimum wage. If that didn't do it, the app definitely won't. Either. Yep. And a lot of times when you're doing research, you'll just cut a bunch of thumpers, like a bunch of different ones, um, because these cards can be really short. They just say that like X policy is very controversial um, or something to that effect. Um, another common answer to politics is the winner's win argument. Can anyone guess what this means? Yes. I think it's saying that like whatever wins you have is like irrelevant because you'll win anyways. Yep. 
Um, so winners win is a pretty intuitive argument. It's just that uh, winners, so like presidents who are always able to get their policies passed, or like congresses, or like certain parties that are really good at passing pieces of legislation, they'll always win. They'll always be able to pass X agenda item, regardless of whether they have fewer political capital, um, or whether Congress has become partisan and divided. Yeah, and this will be less based in the news and more based in like uh, political science research. So uh, if you remember, we talked about like finite and infinite political theory uh, or political capital. A lot of the authors that write things like that will talk will have debates over whether um, presidents lose or gain political capital when they get an agenda item passed. Mm -hmm. so you yep. Questions? Yes. Is there any theory against politics to sense? And like, uh, related to like theodicy? Yeah. Oh, so there's a bunch of, like, a lot of people read theory against the agent counterplans. If you read that with politics of sense, they're like, can't read multi actor fiat because 50 states or like uh -huh. agent counter plans. Uh, some people have creative interpretations of fiat to try to avoid the politics. Uh -huh. Is that like maybe they'll say, like, uh, pass like some people say like, politics is not intrinsic, which means that we can pass the plan and the disadvantage. Um, the reason why this doesn't make sense is because all of your Lincoln internal link evidence proves that there's a trade off between that. Um, uh, some people say like we fiat that um, everyone in Congress and the president support it like, like with no, 100 zero votes. Fiat that. Um, this the problem with this is that it seems pretty abusive to just specify the particular amount of fiat you get. It doesn't seem why seem like there'd be any good reason the app would be entitled to this. Um, things like that. If you have more questions about that, or if any of you do, you're definitely welcome to come talk to us during Socrates stuff. Yeah, which is why it's important during some cross-exes, if you think your opponent might go for that route, um, to make sure that they defend fiat, that they defend normal mm -hmm. means, so that you have no problems getting a link to the politics to sad. And lastly, some other common responses to the politics to sad are obviously disproving the finite theory of political capital. So saying that no, in fact, political capital is infinite, um, non-uniques as to why X policy definitely will pass or is never going to pass regardless. Um, the link is inevitable, which is kind of like the thumper, but it's just like um, regardless of what the current situation is, the link is always going to happen. So like. Congress is always going to become more partisan, which means that X policy isn't going to pass um, like that. Uh, and also a quick note is that when you're answering a politics to sat, you have to make sure that you have correctly diagnosed which type uh -huh. of politics to sat it is, whether it is an agenda politics to sat, a political capital to sat, or the reverse versions of these, because reverse politics and politics actually answer each other, which means that if you read answers for politics on a reverse politics to sat, you'll just be reading arguments for them. Mm -hmm. That makes cross X particularly important. Um, it also means that if you researched a politics this out yourself, um, and or yeah, uh, and someone reads like reverse politics against you, you can actually use your That's research correct. to answer the opposite version since the two directly contradict. Yep. Um, one last thing is just like we talked about news alerts for researching politics, this is also what you should use for answering politics. Because for every article uh, that CNN may be publishing saying that the bill is going to pass now, there's almost certainly another article saying that it's not going to pass. So just being up to date with the news and who's voting for what bills and where they're situated in Congress will help you read the politics this ad and to beat the politics this ad if someone reads it against you. Yep, and that's everything that we have to cover. So if you still have any questions, please come find us during Socrates. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, thank you for coming to our mom. Yeah.